This is the Bible in one year, day 237. Strong families. A busy father was looking for a way to entertain his young daughter. He found a map of the world in a magazine and cut it into pieces. He gave the pieces to his child and suggested she try to piece the map back together. After a very short time, she said she'd finished. He was very surprised by how quickly she'd done it. He asked her how she managed to do it so fast. She replied, I noticed when you took the page out of the magazine that on the back of the map of the world, there was a picture of a man and a woman. I thought if I could put the man and the woman back together, I could put the world back together. Marriage and family life are hugely important. They are part of God's natural order and a vital part of the fabric of society. Pope John Paul II once wrote that family is the foundation of society and nourishes society continually. Nikki and Silla Lee have invested their lives in strengthening marriages and family life. Their courses and books such as the marriage book, the parenting book, have had a profound impact on thousands of people in our own local church and now in many countries around the world. Recently, a government official in one country said to Nikki and Silla, a strong society depends on strong families and strong families depend on strong marriages. That's why we're interested in your work. The Bible has a great deal to say about family life. Not only do we have a natural family, but as Christians, we're part of the church, which the New Testament sees as the family of God. From Psalm 102. Let this be written for a future generation, that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. The Lord looked down from his sanctuary on high. From heaven he viewed the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners and release those condemned to death. So the name of the Lord will be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem when the peoples and the kingdoms assemble to worship the Lord. In the course of my life, he broke my strength. He cut short my days. So I said, Do not take me away, my God, in the midst of my days. Your years go on through all generations. In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens of the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like clothing you will change them and they will be discarded, but you remain the same and your years will never end. The children of your servants will live in your presence. Their descendants will be established before you. Children and the next generation. Every generation has a responsibility to think about the future and to plan for it. We should be concerned not just about what happens in our time, but also about the next generation. The psalmist is concerned for the next generation. Let this be written for a future generation, that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. Jesus is the key for every generation. Interestingly, the writer to the Hebrews quotes verses 25 to 27 of this psalm and applies them to Jesus. Jesus is the same, yesterday and today and forever. He laid earth's foundations a long time ago and handcrafted the very heavens. Jesus will be there forever. Year after year, you're as good as new. The psalm ends with this hope for the next generation. Your servants' children will have a good place to live and their children will be at home with you. This is a hope, a prayer, and to some extent a promise. While everyone is responsible for their own lives, there's a sense in which God treats people as families. We can hope, pray, and believe that our children grandchildren and their descendants will live in his presence and be established before him. Lord, I pray for my own family and for those in the church that we will live in your presence and that our children will grow up to know, love, serve and be established before you. New Testament from 1 Corinthians 16. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you for I will be going through Macedonia. 
Perhaps I will stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace, so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived, because they have supplied what was lacking from you, for they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Family and homes. Inspired by churches, we've seen around the world, we have a big sign outside HTB saying, Welcome home. The vision is that everyone who comes to the church will be welcomed, loved, and given the hospitality that we would give to a guest in our own home. We need to recapture this New Testament vision of church as a home. Of course, the early Christians did not have church buildings. They met in homes. Paul writes to the Corinthians, If Timothy shows up, take good care of him. Make him feel completely at home among you. The church is the family of God. God is our Father. Paul sees the whole church as a family. He talks about other Christians as his brothers and sisters. Church is not an organization you join. It's a family where you belong, a home where you are loved, and a hospital where you find healing. Paul, who was single and did not have his own wife or children, loves the Corinthians and sees them as his family. He found spiritual refreshment by spending time with them. He ends his letter I love all of you. He expects them to love the Lord and to love one another. They should express their love by greeting one another with a holy kiss. This is not just a nice theory. It's very personal. He longs to see them. He knows that they will help him. He does not want to spend only a short time with them. He wants to spend much longer if the Lord permits. Paul's message flows from his love and concern for the people in the church. He practiced what he preached when he wrote, do everything in love. The only reason Paul is not coming sooner is that a great door for effective work has opened to him and there are many who oppose him. It seems that whenever God opens a huge door of opportunity of good work, we should expect that there will also be mushrooming opposition. Do not let such opposition deter you from making the most of great opportunities when they arise. He goes on to talk about Timothy, whom he describes elsewhere as his son in the Lord, his brother Apollos, and the family of Stephanus. It appears from the New Testament that it was quite common for whole families to be converted 
and baptized together. We also see in this passage an instance of a married couple having a joint ministry. Aquila and Priscilla ran a church in their home. Here, Aquila is named first. However, more commonly, Priscilla is the one whom Paul names first. It's clear that they ran the church together. The family of the church is made up of single people like Paul, married couples like Priscilla and Aquila, and whole households like those of Stephanus. Together, we make up the family of God. What Paul writes applies to us all. Keep your eyes open. Hold tight to your convictions. Give it all you've got. Be resolute and love without stopping. Lord, please give us such love for one another that whether we are single or married, we all experience the riches and refreshment of being part of the family of God. Old Testament from 2 Chronicles 24 and 25. Joash was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 40 years. His mother's name was Zibiah. She was from Beersheba. Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years of Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada chose two wives for him, and he had sons and daughters. Sometime later, Joash decided to restore the temple of the Lord. He called together the priests and Levites and said to them, Go to the towns of Judah and collect the money due annually from all Israel to repair the temple of your God. Do it now. But the Levites did not act at once. Therefore the king summoned Jehoiada, the chief priest, and said to him, Why haven't you required the Levites to bring in from Judah and Jerusalem the tax imposed by Moses, the servant of the Lord, and by the assembly of Israel for the tent of the covenant law. Now the sons of that wicked woman, Ataliah, had broken into the temple of God and had used even its sacred objects for the Baals. At the king's command, a chest was made and placed outside at the gate of the temple of the Lord. A proclamation was then issued in Judah and Jerusalem that they should bring to the Lord the tax that Moses, the servant of God, had required of Israel in the wilderness. All the officials and all the people brought their contributions gladly, dropping them into the chest until it was full. Whenever the chest was brought in by the Levites to the king's officials, and they saw that there was a large amount of money, the royal secretary and the officer of the chief priest would come and empty the chest and carry it back to its place. They did this regularly and collected a great amount of money. The king and Jehoiada gave it to those who carried out the work required for the temple of the law. They hired masons and carpenters to restore the Lord's temple, and also workers in iron and bronze to repair the temple. The men in charge of the work were diligent, and the repairs progressed under them. They rebuilt the temple of God according to its original design and reinforced it. When they had finished, they brought the rest of the money to the king and Jehoiada, and with it were made articles for the Lord's temple, articles for the service and for the burnt offerings, and also dishes and other objects of gold and silver. As long as Jehoiada lived, burnt offerings were presented continually in the temple of the Lord. Now Jehoiada was old and full of years, and he died at the age of 130. He was buried with the kings in the city of David, because of the good he had done in Israel for God and his temple. After the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to the king, and he listened to them. They abandoned the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and worshipped Asherah poles and idols. Because of their guilt, God's anger came on Judah and Jerusalem. Although the Lord sent prophets to the people to bring them back to him, and though they testified against them, they would not listen. Then the Spirit of God came on Zechariah, son of Jehoiada the priest. He stood before the people and said, This is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper. Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. 
But they plotted against him, and by order of the king, they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. King Joash did not remember the kindness Zechariah's father, Jehoiada, had shown him, but killed his son, who said as he lay dying, May the Lord see this and call you to account. At the turn of the year, the army of Aram marched against Joash. It invaded Judah and Jerusalem and killed all the leaders of the people. They sent all the plunder to their king in Damascus. Although the Aramean army had come with only a few men, the Lord delivered into their hands a much larger army. Because Judah had forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors, judgment was executed on Joash. When the Arameans withdrew, they left Joash severely wounded. His officials conspired against him for murdering the son of Jehoiada the priest, and they killed him in his bed. So he died, and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the king. Those who conspired against him were Zabad, son of Shimea, an Ammonite woman, and Jehozabad, son of Shimrith, a Moabite woman. The account of his sons, the many prophecies about him, and the record of the restoration of the temple of God are written in the annotations on the book of the kings, and Amaziah his son succeeded him as king. 2 Chronicles chapter 25 Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoaddan. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. After the kingdom was firmly in his control, he executed the officials who had murdered his father, the king. Yet he did not put their children to death, but acted in accordance with what is written in the law in the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, Parents shall not be put to death for their children, nor children be put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. Amaziah called the people of Judah together and assigned them according to their families to commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds for all Judah and Benjamin. He then mustered those twenty years old or more and found that there were three hundred thousand men fit for military service, able to handle the spear and shield. He also hired a hundred thousand fighting men from Israel for a hundred talents of silver. But a man of God came to him and said, Your Majesty, these troops from Israel must not march with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, not with any of the people of Ephraim. Even if you go and fight courageously in battle, God will overthrow you before the enemy, for God has the power to help or to overthrow. Amaziah asked the man of God, But what about the hundred talents I paid for these Israelite troops? The man of God replied, The Lord can give you much more than that. So Amaziah dismissed the troops who had come to him from Ephraim and sent them home. They were furious with Judah and left for home in a great rage. Amaziah then marshaled his strength and led his army to the Valley of Salt, where he killed 10,000 men of Seir. The army of Judah also captured 10,000 men alive, took them to the top of a cliff and threw them down so that all were dashed to pieces. Meanwhile, the troops that Amaziah had sent back and had not allowed to take part in the war raided towns belonging to Judah from Samaria to Beth Horon. They killed 3,000 people and carried off great quantities of plunder. When Amaziah returned from slaughtering the Edomites, he brought back the gods of the people of Seir. He set them up as his own gods, bowed down to them and burned sacrifices to them. The anger of the Lord burned against Amaziah, and he sent a prophet to him who said, Why do you consult this people's gods, who could not save their own people from your hand? While he was still speaking, the king said to him, Have we appointed you an advisor to the king? Stop! Why be struck down? So the prophet stopped but said, I know that God is determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not listened to my counsel. After Amaziah, king of Judah, consulted his advisers, 
he sent this challenge to Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel. Come, let us face each other in battle. But Jehoash, king of Israel, replied to Amaziah, king of Judah, A thistle in Lebanon sent a message to a cedar in Lebanon. Give your daughter to my son in marriage. Then a wild beast in Lebanon came along and trampled the thistle underfoot. You say to yourself that you have defeated Edom, and now you are arrogant and proud. But stay home. Why ask for trouble and cause your own downfall and that of Judah also? Amaziah, however, would not listen. For God so worked that he might deliver them into the hands of Jehoash, because they sought the gods of Edom. So Jehoash, king of Israel, attacked. He and Amaziah, king of Judah, faced each other at Beth Shemesh in Judah. Judah was routed by Israel, and every man fled to his home. Jehoash, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, at Beth Shemesh. Then Jehoash brought him to Jerusalem, and broke down the wall of Jerusalem from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate, a section about 400 cubits long. He took all the gold and silver and all the articles found in the temple of God that had been in the care of Obed-Edom, together with the palace treasures and the hostages, and returned to Samaria. Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, lived for 15 years after the death of Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel. As for the other events of Amaziah's reign, from beginning to end, are they not written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel? From the time that Amaziah turned away from following the Lord, they conspired against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But they sent men after him to Lachish and killed him there. He was brought back by horse, and was buried with his ancestors in the city of Judah. Parents and children. Good parenting is a huge advantage in life. Joash's father died when he was a baby, and he became king at the age of seven. His mother ensured that he was taught and trained by Jehoiada the priest. He clearly received a good education and did what pleased God throughout Jehoiada's lifetime. Joash had a family of his own, which included both sons and daughters. God had promised his blessing on David and his family. Kingship passed down the family line. However, although God's love was unconditional, each person was responsible for how they responded to this love. The book of Moses, probably a way of referring to the law of the first five books of the Old Testament, is quoted in support of the fact that parents shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each of you will die for your own sins. We each pay personally for our sins. We see this principle worked out here. Joash started out well. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He decided to restore the temple of the Lord. Everyone joined in. All the officials and all the people brought their contributions gladly, dropping them into the chest until it was full. They rebuilt the temple of God according to its original design. Buildings for worship do matter and can be restored if everyone gets involved. Sadly, Joash's reign did not end well. It's so important not just to start well, but also to finish well. Tragically, the same pattern was repeated in the life of his son, Amaziah. He started well, but did not finish well. He became arrogant and proud and turned away from following the Lord. Lord, help us to be good examples and to finish well. I pray that family life would once again be the foundation to nourish our society continually. May there be a reversal in the decline in marriages and a restoration of strong families. Pepper adds, With good advice, young children can accomplish great things. We mustn't underestimate them. Joash became king at the age of seven. With the help of Jehoiada, the priest, as his advisor, Joash built the temple. While he had a good advisor, the people of Israel worshipped God. Sadly, when his advisor died, he went off the rails. It is important to go on seeking wise counsel. And we all need to encourage the next generation.